Welcome to Speedrunner Reviews. In this series I'll be analysing and reviewing games using the mindset of speedrunning. This video will look at the game from three perspectives. First the casual experience, which is how most people will first play the game. This will look like a condensed standard review. Next we'll discuss the speedrun experience, including all the interesting tech and how well the game holds up as a speed game. Finally we'll look at the tool assisted speedrun, showing what the game looks like when pushed to the theoretical limit. If you already know this game and want to jump straight to the speedrun part, I've left timestamps in the description. Today we're looking at Metroid, which was released on the Famicom NES in about 1986. This is one of the most important games ever released as it shaped the Metroidvania genre, and it's hard to overstate the impact that it's had. While it's often overshadowed by its sequels, the original still has a lot to offer. Let's have a look. Now right off the bat I want to mention, this is an absolutely huge game, especially for 1986. Just have a look at the map there. And for that reason I won't be able to talk about every little aspect, otherwise we'll never get on to talking about the speedrun. But what I want to do in this section is tell you a bit about what the series is, if you haven't seen it before, but also talk about why, although there are frustrating bits in Metroid 1, it's still worth playing, even though some of the other sequels refine the formula. So if you were playing this game in 1986, this is probably what it would have looked like. You played most NES games like Mario or whatever, you just start running to the right, you check it out, you can probably jump and shoot, that's cool, you can shoot up, you can shoot left, there's enemies, you can kill enemies, and there's doors that you can open by shooting the doors. Uh, you'll come across these blocks which look breakable but you can't really find any way to break them so you'll just keep going along. Now eventually, if you keep doing this though, you're going to run into some issues because you'll get to this section and, well, Samus can't get through. So all of your sensibilities for playing NES games will be questioned at this point. You might start trying to go back to the left and what do you know, you find your first power up. So right off the bat, this game tells you going right is not necessarily the way to win. You might want to get this morph ball power up and hey, now you can squeeze through small gaps. Look at that. Now we had other games that had exploration aspects like Zelda or whatever. Um, but this was one of the first and it's really fun to see that they were willing to defy the norms so early on in the game. So as you might have seen, the whole point of this game is finding upgrades, powering up, getting through the bosses and exploring the world. So the first upgrade you get is the Morph Ball and that lets you get into those small gaps and pretty soon you'll also get the Bomb to accompany this. Now the bomb is something really important that I think makes this game really intricate and in-depth. If you've played Super Metroid before and you try and kill these enemies, you're going to have a really bad time because you can't duck and shoot and you can't shoot down. And for a lot of people that would be a frustrating thing when they first play this game and in all honesty it is. But it makes the bomb upgrade more useful because you can then lay bombs and try and kill enemies that are on the ground. Also on top of this, if you're in this corridor and you lay a bomb, well you'll actually be able to go down in this area. The other thing that bombs are useful for are bomb jumps. So you lay a bomb and then you jump off of it and that'll look something like this. You can also chain those, which is kind of cool. And you can get a lot of height off that. Now for people who have started off their Metroid journey by playing Super Metroid, I can see why they will get frustrated at this room. This room comes up again in Super Metroid but here you don't need the bomb at all. In Super Metroid you can just shoot down through the blocks. And while this is really fun the first time you do it, I feel like you do lose something when you do this. Because in Metroid 1 the bomb upgrade really means a lot. Because you can't shoot enemies that are on the ground and you can't shoot down. So it solves a lot of problems for you and makes you do a lot of problem solving with it. Whereas in Super Metroid, although shooting down is an upgrade, you do lose a bit of that puzzle solving aspect. And I can see why not being able to shoot down would make people frustrated to start off with Metroid 1. The next power up I want to talk about are the missiles. So you have your normal shot that you can fire, but if you press select you'll be able to fire missiles. Now you start off by only having 5 of these, and you always just have a limited amount. You can get more by killing enemies though. Now the main thing the missiles are used for is killing enemies quickly, but realistically what most people use them for are opening these red doors. So it takes five shots through a red door to open it. Now, this is actually somewhere where I got stuck a lot with the series. I started off with Super Metroid and then, well, I got the missiles, I shot the red door and I thought, okay, that does nothing. So there must be some other way to open these red doors that I don't have yet. 
So yeah, that's something that I wish was conveyed a little bit better in the series to make it more obvious that you need to use five missiles to open a red door and it can be some way you can get stuck when you start off. Now although there are many more upgrades, the last one I'm going to talk about in depth is the Ice Beam. And basically what the Ice Beam does is it lets you freeze an enemy in its place. So that can be used to find lots of secrets like when you go up here and you see this energy tank in the roof, well you need to freeze this enemy to actually get up there. Uh, I feel like this energy tank in particular was made to sell more copies of Nintendo Power, but it's cool that you have to problem solve with the Ice Beam to get up there. The other cool section with the Ice Beam is this bit where you basically make a ladder out of the enemies to climb up this shaft. And yeah, it's a fun use of the Ice Beam there. Now Super Metroid introduced a wall jump, which you could basically just jump up this wall. And while that's really fun to play with and opens up a lot of that game, I think this game, again, gets a bit of criticism for not having something like that. But if they did include a wall jump here, then the Ice Beam wouldn't have as many cool problem solving aspects to it. So it's nice that we got some room to play with the Ice Beam before we were introduced to the wall jump. Now as soon as you have these basic tools like the Ice Beam and the Morph Ball and stuff, you can combine them to do some pretty cool skips. Like in this room for example, you can shoot up through the roof, and you'd normally need the high jump to get up this area. You can get up into the roof by just jumping on the blocks that respawn in, but to avoid needing the high jump, you can actually pull this enemy up here and freeze it, and then jump off it to get through this door. That saves you needing the high jump, and in here is the Varia suit, which reduces the amount of damage you take by half. So it's a really good item to get, and you can get it very close to the start of the game, but only if you really know what you're doing. And that rewards people who are playing around and trying to find exploits, which is something that wasn't really a familiar concept in 1986. Now in terms of sequence breaking, Super Metroid definitely stepped it up with things like wall jumps and mock balling, but Metroid 1 started it off and has some really cool, really ingenious sequence breaks in it. So I want to talk a bit about my first experience playing Metroid, which is probably different to a lot of people. Um, I grew up playing Sega consoles, not Nintendo, so I didn't play the NES until I had a job and some disposable income. Then I went out to cash converters, bought myself a NES and started playing all the NES library. It was lots of fun exploring this and I found lots of gems that way. Now I was playing through pretty much everything and Metroid was pretty high up my list on that. So I popped this game in, gave it a go, I ended up in this blue hallway and everything looked exactly the same. So I found the blue hallway, then I found the yellow hallway which was very similar and I just had no idea where I was going and pretty quickly I died and had to start again and just didn't know what I was doing. Um, given that I was about 14 or 15 at this point, I didn't have the same patience that a kid normally has playing the game and I had a whole bunch of other NES games to try. So after playing it for a couple hours, I put it down and thought, I'll come back to this eventually. Never did, not for a long time. Um, but then I got the Super Nintendo and a similar thing happened. I played all that library, including Super Metroid. And I almost did the same thing, although at that point I was playing it with my brother, so we both sort of slogged through it and tried to learn about the game. We got stuck for a long time in Super Metroid for that uh, missile door reason. We didn't realize it took five missiles to open the door. Seems silly now, but that's just what happened to us. But after playing Super Metroid, it really made me appreciate this game a bit more, because I saw what this game was trying to do, and probably what this game was capable of if I had the patience to step it out, figure out the map, and figure out the upgrade system. So that's the big thing about this game, is it doesn't have a map for you to use. So if you're going to be playing it, you'll probably these days just use a walkthrough, um, but if you're going to play it back in 1986, you probably like take home your mass book from school with a grid paper, uh, start drawing out the map there and figure out where to go in the game. That's something that I've done with a lot of games, for example Fantasy Star, I mapped out all the dungeons just on grid paper, um, but it's something I was a little bit old for by the time I played this. Um, but still, I can imagine a lot of people doing that back in 1986 and having a really deep knowledge and understanding of this game just through their own exploration, before looking it up on the internet was the thing. So let's talk a bit more about how this game holds up in terms of playability and graphics and everything. In terms of the graphics, I really like it. So you've got different types of jumps for Samus and you've got this morph ball ability and everything looks really smooth. All the animations kind of work. The door opening is really smooth, for example, and the enemies are all pretty well animated. And you can sort of see what the enemies are going to do and what their weak spots are just from looking at them. 
Now, this game was really impressive because of how big it was and how they achieved that is every screen is broken up into like a one screen size chunk and they can repeat these chunks. So for example, if I fall down this uh, shaft here, the same chunks are gonna repeat over and over. And this chunk here with the door transition here would be used a whole bunch of times throughout the game. And same as this chunk, this will just be a repalette of the old one. So because they can do levels in chunks and repeat the chunks, uh, they can get a lot more map into the game than they otherwise could. Now, of course, the disadvantage of this is that a lot of the game is going to look pretty same-ish because the same chunks will be repeated and maybe just have a different palette or different enemy layouts or something. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It helps make the game a bit bigger, but it also makes it more confusing because it's harder to navigate. Although if they didn't have this chunk system, the game would be pretty small and might not have achieved what they'd set out for it to do. Another small thing to mention is music in this game. Uh, so the main theme that plays through the game is very memorable for me. And that's mainly from Super Smash Brothers playing the stage there. Uh, but then when I actually played Metroid for the first time, I thought, oh, okay, so that's where it's from. That's pretty cool to hear it. Um, you've also got lovely sound effects and when you're low on health, your uh, the sound will blink and beep. So that indicates to you that you're low on health. Kind of a nice little feature. Now in terms of difficulty, I think this game is actually pretty hard, but strikes a good balance. So as with a lot of NES games, they made it difficult to get more uh, playtime out of the game, but uh, I think it's pretty fair. And you have the option, you can go and explore for power-ups and upgrades, and that'll get you more use to the controls as well, or you can just go straight ahead and fight all the bosses. Now the bosses will give you a whole bunch of missiles as an upgrade, so it's worth fighting these bosses early if you can. But if you can't fight the bosses for whatever reason, then just go and get a bunch more upgrades and try again later. So having that variable difficulty, I think is a real big selling point of this game. In terms of replayability, you have a few options. You can 100% the game, uh, which is lots of fun. You'll get 255 missiles if you do that, which is a very familiar number, especially on the NES. Uh, but searching out all those items is pretty enjoyable if you want some replay value. And although I won't show it here for spoiler reasons, there are multiple endings on this game depending how fast you beat it. So that's something that's pretty fun to come back to and try and do better each time. And also it would have inspired some early people to pick up something like speedrunning on this game. A lot of people claim that some features are like the first one to inspire speedrunning, but this is definitely one of the earlier ones, along with a lot of games which have time trial modes and everything like that. There are some frustrating aspects in here, like how hard some of the secrets are to find, this one being an example, but if you follow a walkthrough, that stuff shouldn't really be an issue. Now, one thing I absolutely love about this game is the lack of text. This is about the only text you'll see until the credits. As soon as you got through this text, you're just thrown into the world, you run, you jump, you shoot, that's it. So, this game's often said to be like a combination of Mario and Zelda. So you get the platforming from Mario and the adventuring from Zelda, and that should appeal to both fan bases for that reason. But for me, you get something in the combination that you don't get in each individual one. Mario for me is very simple and I prefer my games to have a lot of exploration, but I feel like when they do have exploration, they're often accompanied with a lot of NPCs and dialogue that really slow things down. Now, although I don't have a problem with reading, when I'm playing a video game, I'm not in the mood to read through a whole wall of text to figure out what I need to do. And I prefer when my puzzles have stuff to do with the environment and physics rather than just figuring out the right NPC to talk to. So that's something that I really love about the Metroid series. You're just in the game with the physics, you get the adventure, but you don't get all the fluff around it. Really good stuff. So although there are some aspects of this game that haven't aged the best, I think it's definitely still worth trying today, both for historical reasons to see how far the franchise has come, but also because it is still a really fun game to play. There's a lot of fun problem solving, and if you follow a walkthrough for the map, you'll get to avoid some of the more frustrating bits of how this game has aged. So before talking about any one particular speedrun, I want to show you a couple of speedrun tricks that can be used all over the place, and these will even make a casual playthrough more enjoyable. The first is the Morph Ball Double Jump. So you've got your normal jump with Samus and you can't jump any 
any extra times than that. But if you morph ball off an edge and unmorph, you can get another jump out of the air. So that's often used when you're trying to get a jump under like a ledge or something. You just jump off, get another double jump. Really useful stuff. Um, the other useful thing is rapid fire. So normally in games you'll shoot a lot by just pressing the B button over and over. But if you hold down the B button, well you'll get this shot here. But if you keep it held down and then press right or left or up or whatever, you'll get another shot. So you get a shot for pressing B, another shot for pressing right, and then another shot for letting go of right. So the fastest way to shoot in this game is to hold down the shoot button and just keep mashing the right button over and over. And that'll do two bullets for every one time you press the right button and let it go, as opposed to a bullet for just every single press. So it's about twice as fast as you could fire in a normal game. Really useful. The other glitch you'll see all over the run isn't that useful in a casual playthrough, but it is really cool and saves a whole bunch of time. It's called the door glitch. So when you open a door, you can wait for it to close and it'll close on you. And then you're kind of stuck in the wall there. Uh, you can just run out, but what's more interesting is if you duck and unduck, you'll gain a little bit of height. So you never want to just duck, otherwise you'll get into a morph ball and then you actually can't get out and you'll be stuck. But if you keep ducking and unducking to gain height, you'll climb this wall and you'll eventually come all the way up through the bottom of the screen and wrap back around. And that lets you do a whole bunch of shortcuts because now we're under those blocks. Now pretty recently, someone called Metal Machine programmed a Lua script to visualize what's going on with this door glitch. So this stuff you can see over the top is literally just the map that we're playing on like some us were uh, running around here. But if we run into the door, we can see what's actually going on. So we'll get in here and we'll keep uh, rising up through the roof. And what's going to happen when you hit the top is you're going to actually wrap around to the bottom. Just like that. Now that I'm down the bottom, if I do one more, I can run out and sort of like run around the normal level. Now where I am now, it's under where the actual screen is. But if I keep jumping up, I'll get back to where uh, the screen is supposed to be. These yellow blocks are enemies, so you got to like avoid those. But you should be able to make it up. And there we are, we're under the blocks. Now we've unlocked the screen and it can scroll down. And we've just got down into this section without having bombs. Really, really cool stuff. Um, I didn't have this Lewis script while making the Taz, so it's only a recent innovation and it's a huge improvement. Really good for finding strats with this door skip. So now let's have a look at the leaderboards and what categories this game has to offer. You can see it's broken down into three main categories. We've got any percent, all bosses and 100%. 100% understandably is collecting all the items in the game. Then all bosses is sort of doing the two bosses that you need to beat the game properly. Now any percent is just beating the game without any restrictions as fast as you can. Now traditionally this game was run kind of as deathless and what that means is you're not allowed to die. But also in any percent what they do is a little trick called up plus A on the second controller where if you pause and press up plus A on controller two, the game simulates a death but you don't have to spend a bunch of time taking damage to do that. So that's how they use a death in any percent and it can save some backtracking and get you back to the start of areas quicker like Craig's Lair for example. Any percent deathless was traditionally run a lot more because that was the rule set that was in favour but it looks like any percent has taken a bit more precedent over the years because it's a faster way to do it. And honestly I'm pretty happy to see any percent come first here because I've never been a fan of the deathless rule myself. So you'll see a lot of the leaderboards are dominated by sort of CHX and C Scotty. Uh, CHX has recently made a really good video destroying Metroid, talking about uh, all the grind to get world record and everything. I'd recommend giving it a watch if you haven't seen it. Um, today we're going to be focusing on the any percent world record. A lot of the tricks are similar with 100% and there wouldn't be much more for me to talk about in 100%. But also I'm more familiar with any percent, so hopefully it'll be better hearing me talk about that compared to 100%. Just a heads up that the speedrunning section will unavoidably have some spoilers in it. I'll try and keep everything pretty much chronological so the end of the game should fall towards the end of the speedrunning section. So the run we'll be looking at today is the current world record which sits at 912.150. The game will start off pretty standard with getting the morph ball but it's not going to be long until it gets completely broken. 
So pretty much immediately here, CHX is gonna do a door glitch and do this screen wrap here. This is the one that I showed before and it basically skips needing bombs. You can see CHX jumping towards the top of the door before going into there, jumping up here to unlock the screen and scrolling it down. And this gets us straight into Kraid's Lair, which is gonna be the first and only of the two bosses that we do. Now normally the path into Kraid looks something like this. You're gonna go down from the elevator, go right through this room, down and then left. But we're gonna see CHX do another door clip to skip most of this navigation. Now at the bottom of this room coming up, there's this section here that's one way. You can usually only go from right to left, but we'll see the first door clip here is gonna be used to skip past this one way bit. There we go, Samus comes through the hall just like that. The next door skip we're gonna see is gonna get us straight into the crate room. Now, traditionally what happens is you would have to get hit by an enemy to get through the missile only door. But there's been a new skip found with the Lua script to help that lets CHX get straight through this door without having to get hit by the enemy. Just coming back to this door, a small note is that you couldn't open that missile door anyway because we don't have missiles at this point. So that's why you need to get hit by the enemy or use this new skip. Uh, there was a similar skip in the Taz, which came out before, but recently it was found to be possible RTA using this new setup. CHX is gonna get this hidden energy tank in the Kraid fight and then go and defeat Kraid. Now I've tried learning this category RTA a long time ago and this is one of the bits that put me off. This fight is really difficult to do well and CHX is doing a brilliant job of it. Using that mashing the left button to mash faster strategy here, getting up really close and just firing over and over. Uh, there's a bit of RNG in this fight so you have to react to what's going on in it. And Craig can shoot the spikes there to kind of stop you from hitting him. Now once you've done the Kraid fight here, the intended strategy is to go right out of this room, up and then left, and then you've sort of got to get up this bit to get to the elevator again. We're going to see CHX skip this. So the way CHX skips the navigation is going to be to do that up plus A trick on controller 2. Once the Kraid fight's completed here, you'll see pretty quickly he's going to get what looks like a game over or a death and go straight back to that elevator. And this is the part where this category looks different to the more traditional any percent deathless category. But that skips a lot of navigation and a pretty difficult trick to get back out of here as well without the ice beam. Speaking of the ice beam, back in this main area, that's the next thing CHX is going to get. Uh, by doing a door glitch up here, he can get to the ice beam. Uh, now, normally you'd need the bombs to get through this section here, so this skips needing those. The ice beam is required for a few reasons, uh, one of which is to freeze the metroids in the last area, otherwise they will pretty much always kill you. Um, the other one is to make getting into that area without beating Ridley a little bit easier, which we'll see shortly. Now normally to get into the last area of the game you need to beat the two bosses Kraid and Ridley. Once you've done that you rise up these statues and that sort of makes a bridge across this area which lets you get through. That area is pretty difficult to get through without there being a bridge there. So you might be wondering, well, CHX hasn't beaten Ridley, how's he gonna get into this last area? And the answer is he's gonna lure this enemy here into the room and we're gonna use an ice beam strategy to get through. So yeah, he won't be able to make the bridge, but we lure the enemy in here, shoot the ice beam at it, and then do a morph ball clip to get through that floor there. Now that's really tense because the whole time you're on the sand, you're taking damage and the enemy can move in some pretty erratic patterns. So it takes a lot of getting used to to do that skip. Now you might be wondering why did he bother fighting Kraid at all if he didn't need to fight Kraid to raise the bridge? And the answer for that is missiles. This section here is very tight on missiles and you need a lot to beat the last boss and Kraid just happens to give you a lot of missiles really quickly. So that's why Kraid's fought in the run. Speaking of missiles, it's a big choke point of this run to run out of missiles for the last boss and it basically just depends on your RNG. So CHX needs to get up to a full stock and these Metroids can randomly drop missiles. What he's gonna do is stack them on top of each other with the ice beam and then destroy them hoping to get missiles, which in this run he does, understandably, because it's the world record. So the Metroids can be pretty scary as well. If you don't have the ice beam, they're basically gonna always kill you. So that's another reason why he gets the ice beam in the run. 
Now there's not much I can say about this last room except for it's a really impressive display of platforming skill and shooting skill. You want to break through these doors to get to the last boss, Mother Brain, and you want to get pretty close to these doors because you can't shoot your next missile until your original one's gone off screen. So we're doing a lot of morph ball jumps to get through here and CHX is avoiding all the obstacles as he goes. But that is really tricky to do this room well and it's where a lot of runners differ in their time. After Mother Brain's defeated, there's a little escape sequence where you have to jump up this corridor. And I've never speedrun Metroid myself, but I can imagine this would be a very tense moment. Given how floaty the jump physics are in this game, it would be really easy to fall off here and lose your world record pace run. But CHX handles it perfectly. So that's going to be all that I say about this speedrun, but it's a really impressive showcase of how far this game has come. I remember when I made the Taz for this game, there weren't as many runners of it and it wasn't as popular as something like a Super Metroid, but it's gained a lot of popularity over the years and it's really nice to see how far it's come. If you're thinking about picking it up as a speed game, it is pretty difficult, especially because you're on very low health through the whole thing, but it's really enjoyable to play both casually and as a speed game. So the task we'll be looking at today was done by myself back in 2018. And honestly, it's one of the most optimized tasks I've ever done. We've got the frame count and the re-record count. Basically what the re-record count means is how many times did I redo something, like go back and change and try something else? 145,000 times. Uh, compared to the actual movie, which is only 28,000 frames wrong, that's a pretty big ratio. Usually your frame count and your re-record count are about the same number but this is like five times as big. So a lot of effort went into this Taz and I tried to squeeze out every little frame that I could. So before we start watching the Taz, I want to talk about some physics in this game. Now this is what Taz Studio looks like and this basically shows us what inputs are being pressed. For example, right here, I'm just holding right or if I press A, then Samus is going to jump. So realistically, let's be looking at our values up here and I'm going to make them a bit bigger for us to see. Realistically, you don't want to be jumping because if you're walking, your X speed is one pixel and 128 sub pixels, as we can see up the top there in X Vel. But if you jump, it's one pixel and 32 sub pixels. So it's just a little bit over 60% as fast to jump than it is to walk. So you want to be walking as much as you can. The thing I really want to talk about here is Y sub pixels. So currently I'm sitting on a Y value of 193 and then the sub pixel is 128 just up there. Uh, but if I were to jump, then that would change. So I'm still sitting on pixel 193, but now my sub pixel is 160. So that changes when you jump, interesting stuff. So if I jump a few times, I can change my Y sub pixel value pretty much to anything that I want. So let's check this out. It's currently sitting at 200 and there's 256 sub pixels in a pixel. And sub pixel is just like an amount smaller than a pixel. So I'm still sitting on pixel 193, but I'm sitting down pretty low because 200 is pretty close to 256. Let's try and jump up to this platform here and see if I can get it. So I'm gonna do that jump and I've made it. And I have to hold A for this long. If I hold A for any less long, I won't make that jump. But let's change our sub pixels and see if we can do something else. So currently I'm sitting on a sub pixel of 200, but if I take out this jump, for example, I'm going to be sitting on 168. Can I make the jump now? No, I can't. So let's see if I can get a really low sub pixel value, like zero, for example, would be really good, or even something small like 56. Let's try and make that jump. Now, remember last time to make the jump, I had to hold up to frame 2464 and I made the jump, but now, I only have to hold up to frame 2463 to make the jump. Because my sub pixels are higher when I start the jump, because 56 is a smaller number, I actually start Samus up higher before the jump starts. Now what this means is that you have to jump for less time, and it also means you're in the air for less long, which is really good. So this doesn't come into play too much in this room, because that's just a simple jump, and jumping for one less frame doesn't matter too much. But where it does come into play is in the next room when you're going up this elevator shaft. Sorry, not the next room, but it'll come into play pretty soon. When you're going up that big long elevator shaft, you want your sub pixel values to make sense and give you the smallest jumps possible. Now, of course, when you have different sub pixel values, you're going to get different sub pixel values at the end of the jump. 
So here I ended the jump on uh, 24 as my Y sub pixel. But if I had this smaller jump where I started with a Y sub pixel of zero and I did it, I'd end up on 40 with my Y sub pixel. So what I had to do with the Taz was plan out what all my sub pixels would look like and map out, well, if my sub pixel was here, where would I end up after the jump and how long would that jump be? All to spend the shortest time in the air possible. And this is the small things you can do in a Taz that you'd never really do in RTA, but planning out every single little jump to save those tiny bits of time. So you can see in the Taz submission text here, I have sort of mapped out what all my sub pixels could be before the, before the first door glitch and figured out how many frames are wasted with each of those and then pick the sub pixel that I actually want to have as a result of that. And it's important to note that all these time saves are adding up to something around the range of 0.05 seconds. So definitely not worth planning out something like this for an RTA speedrun. So the TAS we're going to be looking at today is my TAS in 757. So this TAS is going to look pretty much the same as the RTA route. There's no major developments. When this TAS came out, that Cray door skip without damage was TAS only, but since now it's done in RTA as well, they're going to look pretty similar. What we're going to be seeing more of in this TAS is that sub pixel manipulation that I talked about before, and a lot more play around where there's downtime, like this one, for example. So I'm going to do the first door glitch here and come up. I've lined up the sub pixels perfectly and you'll see me take damage on that enemy there. That reduces a little bit of lag coming down this corridor. So one big factor in this Taz is the lag reduction. There's lag pretty much everywhere in this game, especially in the Kraid fight. So I'm doing everything that I can to get enemies off screen or to be in certain animations that are less laggy. There's actually a few frame rolls in this game, a bit like Super Mario Brothers, but they're not to the same extent as being 21 frames. They're usually like somewhere between two and four frames. I'm lag reducing down here and then I'm going to do a big bounce up into this door to get really high before doing that door wrap. Usually you can only get as high as a jump takes you, so that allows you a little bit more room to get higher and save a bit more time. In this next room, I'm going to do another bounce to get up into the door glitch at a higher height, and I'm lining up my X subpixel to do this crate skip. The way the crate skip works is you turn around on a certain subpixel, and that lets you go down a pixel and turn into the door. You have to have very precise positioning to line it up, though, and that saves a bit of time. I don't fully understand the RTA method, so I can't tell whether it's faster or not, but this is the only way that was known at the time of doing the Taz. In the Kraid fight here, there's going to be frame perfect mashing, so that'll be a little bit faster than RTA here. I've also manipulated Kraid not to fire too many missiles and tried to reduce lag in that fight as much as possible. The Taz will use the up plus A trick on controller 2 to get back here because it just goes for fastest time possible. Coming into these corridor climbing sections, this is honestly one of the most optimized hardest bits of the Taz, even though it looks like a basic climb. If you look at this climb compared to how RTA does it, you'll notice a lot of my jumps are extremely short, and that's because I've manipulated all the sub pixels to line up perfectly and make them as short as possible. I also don't waste any frames by holding A for longer than I need to, unless I'm doing it to manipulate sub pixels. One thing that I will mention as part of this climb is when I get to the end of it, you'll see me jump a lot higher than I need to before going into the door. And we'll see that about here jump higher than I need to and go through. The reason is, if you have the screen too low before you go into the door, it's going to have to rise up before it scrolls horizontally through the door because it needs to get into the right position. So by having the screen into the right position normally before that, you're going to save a bit of time because you can scroll the screen, screen quicker by jumping than it scrolls by itself when trying to adjust for the door. Now the section of the Taz getting the ice beam looks pretty much the same. I'm going to do a door wrap up here and get through. When you do the door wraps, you can frame perfectly duck and unduck, so it's a little bit faster than RTA in that sense, and also you don't have the same level of risk that you have of missing one, because the Taz can just do perfect inputs. Again, taking damage to reduce a bit of lag through the door. And also, I can set up this door transition to make the enemies be where I want them to be, because sometimes you can take damage in really awkward spots. Coming up to Taz Bridge Skip, this is going to work pretty much the same as RTA. Now I'm going to get into Turian, and this area has these Cheerio looking enemies, they're like these red circles. And they cause a lot of lag and they can also cause you damage when they hit you, so I have to avoid those somehow. We'll see our first lot when I come through this door, but what I'm going to do is actually pause the game over and over as I'm going through this door. 
And what happens when you do that is it kind of stops the Cheerios from spawning in a sense. I mentioned before there are frame rules in this game, and I think it's something like every four frames a Cheerio has a chance to spawn. So if you time your pauses so that you're paused every time it hits that four frame counter, the Cheerio won't spawn because it's paused. Um, and the frame rule keeps running when it's paused. So you can sort of pause over that time where it would normally spawn and then unpause to get the frame rule advance and get moving through the door and then pause again as soon as you think one of them is going to spawn. For that reason, there's a lot less Cheerios in the Taz than you'll ever see in RTA. Now you may notice in this room here, we just saw that Samus is kind of like floating in the morph ball when under these roofs. That's kind of a glitch that you can do when you're close to a roof and a floor at the same time, where you can trigger a bounce to happen over and over and kind of make Samus float in place. It's kind of cool to see in the Taz and it does save a little bit of time, but it's mainly for play around purposes. Now I mentioned in the RTA speedrun that this section's quite tense because you need enough missiles for the final boss, but the Taz can RNG manipulate to always get missiles. So that one there, I only bother freezing that one Metroid and get the missiles from it. And if I didn't get missiles, all I'd have to do is wait for a tiny bit longer and try again and then I probably would get missiles. Now if you're familiar with this room, you'll know that a lot of those ring Cheerio enemies spawn but I'm going to be using that pause exploit to make sure basically none of them spawn. Now it costs time to keep pausing and unpausing like this, but it actually reduces so much lag on screen that it's worth doing. Not to mention I don't have to duck and weave around the Cheerios. I'll sometimes let one spawn in like that, but realistically it doesn't matter if there's one, it only matters when there's heaps on screen. And the Taz is going to finish up with an escape sequence, of course manipulated to get good Y sub pixels and save those valuable frames. Uh, this Taz was really enjoyable to do, but it took me such a long time to put together just this 8 minute video of Taz. Um, the reason for that is just because these optimizations take a long time to map out and you kind of have to imagine all the possible sub pixels you can be on before you do the trick. Also thinking about routing, lag reduction, frame rules and everything around that. So I'd love to come back and do like 100% Taz one day, but it would be such a big project that I'd need to sink a lot of time into it. But I really enjoyed learning about how some of the physics and mechanics work in this game, and it was really fun to sort of have a look into that. It helps me understand the speedrun a lot better having done the Taz, and I'd love to try RTA someday, but I'm not quite good enough to do that fast mashing on the boss kills and stuff like that. So that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you enjoyed this content, then a subscription is always appreciated and I should have more videos coming out like it soon. Thanks for watching.